My name is Fred Cook, and I drive school bus. My name is Leanne Murchie, and I'm a school bus driver for TCAPS. It's been a very wonderful experience. When I first hired in, one of the previous bus drivers told me that this particular job, driving school bus, is the best job on earth. So I immediately took to it, uh, and uh, I have to agree that this is one of the best jobs that anyone can do. What prompted me in the very beginning, I have a college degree, and she said, you're in the safest vehicle in the world, on the road. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try. It's Because I would be on the same time schedule as my own children. And when they were off, I was off. When holidays, I was, you know, I was there. So it was the best of both worlds. TCAPS offers jobs with elsewhere within the, the system. Between routes, I used to, for 12, 13 years, I did lunch duty over at East Middle School, and now I paint. They're real good about finding people the hours that they need during the course of the day to make the job great. We have Mesa Insurance. The whole district has it. It's awesome. It's the best health insurance. We offer a 401k. There's a sign-on bonus. It's a win-win situation. The most important thing, I think, coming to work at TCAPS is you understand it is it, you understand that you are a part of a team. It's a part of a collective. You know, it's not just bus drivers and then versus teachers. It's not that. We all are in in this thing called All right, I've got 4.30, so I call this meeting of the Board Finance and Operations Committee to order. The committee would like to welcome the audience. Viewers may watch board committee meetings live on TV 190 or online at tcaps.net backslash board. Recorded meetings may be viewed on demand at the same address. Uh, the committee has set aside this time for public comment. Megan, do we have any public comment? Public comment. All right, moving on. We The first item on the agenda is a conference call with Dave Nielsen from Manor Kesterson. Uh, Christine, do you have an... We have Dave on uh, speakerphone and Dave... Uh, Christine, do you want to do any introductions? Um, no, this is just, well, this a little bit. Okay. So this is just our um, annual conversation so that um, the audit firm can speak directly to board members as it relates to the upcoming audit, what to expect, any changes that might have occurred, um, and any questions that you guys have, and then have that open line of communication so that throughout that process, if you have questions, know that you are free to reach out to them at any time. So hi, Dave. Hey, Christine. How's it going? Good. All right, Dave, so uh, Andrew Raymond here. I'm the treasurer, chair of the, BF, uh, of the finance committee. And we've got uh, um, Secretary Ballinger and Trustee Bird, and then uh, the rest of the administration teams here as well. So go ahead. Excellent. Well, hey, thank you for the introduction, and I appreciate uh, two things. First of all, the opportunity to be your auditors again this year, and secondly, the opportunity to speak with you before uh, we get started on the final audit field work uh, in August. I believe actually July 31 might be the first day, but the beginning of August. Uh, so we do appreciate that. Um, so really our purpose today is to go over sort of what I would say our, our audit plan for the audit of the June 30, 2023 financial statements. And again, it will be a annual comprehensive financial report for June 30, 2023. Uh, the district did receive the certificate of financial excellence once again uh, for fiscal year 2022. Uh, that's a great achievement. A lot of hard work goes into that. Uh, so kudos again there. Uh, and we will uh, go through the, the additional steps um, to assist with the annual comprehensive financial report again for this year. Uh, the, from an overall perspective, uh, in terms of filing with the state, uh, that due date hasn't changed. That's still November 1, um, with the federal data collection form being due 30 days after the audit is filed. Uh, so those due dates haven't changed. Um, so we can kind of have an idea of sort of the overall timeline of what the audit looks like. 
Um, we did have preliminary field work last week, um, which went very well, and I will sort of get into that a little bit uh, during this call, but wanted to let you know that we were out there for that uh, last week. Um, as part of our preliminary audit field work, uh, we do look at internal controls. Um, so when we're looking at internal controls, we're looking at the key controls that are in place over the significant transaction classes that are present in the financial state. There are a few, uh, and I'll, I'll list them off right now. The first one being bank reconciliations. Second one is cash receipts and revenue recognition. The third one is cash disbursements and expenses. And then payroll, obviously the largest um, uh, probably sector of the financial statements. Uh, it's a pretty significant transaction class. So when we're doing our payroll internal control review um, and each of the other internal control reviews for the other significant transaction classes, we're looking at the key controls that are in place over those transaction classes, making sure that they are um, operating effectively and documented. Documentation is certainly a key. Um, and when it comes to payroll, um, we do separate internal control walkthroughs of hourly pay, salary pay, and employees that are charged to federal grants. It's another big area. In addition to the internal control work that we performed last week, uh, we also worked through our fraud risk assessment testing. Um, so present in every financial statement audit, there are two sort of significant fraud risks that we would identify. Um, so they're not unique to Traverse City. Um, they're present in every financial statement audit. The first one is improper revenue recognition. So we take a couple of steps there that we would consider extended or additional audit procedures uh, in response to that risk. And that would be primarily confirming the state aid revenue, confirming property taxes, and confirming federal revenue. Those three sources combined make up the majority of the revenue for school districts. The other risk that's present uh, in every financial statement audit is improper, or sorry, management override of controls. In response to that risk, um, we do have a few different tests that we do. Uh, one would be getting a copy of the check register, uh, scanning for any gaps in the sequence um, that could indicate a missing check. Um, we look at payments to key employees. We look at um, payments to the top vendors for the year and we compare that to last year. Maybe there's a new vendor this year, and, and who are they? Are they legitimate? Or maybe there was a vendor from last year that's no longer a vendor this year, and why is that? Um, so we do look at a few areas within the check register uh, in response to that risk. Other tests that we do for the risk uh, related to management override of controls, we test journal entries that are posted during the year. That's a requirement. So adjusting journal entries, we're taking a copy of that report, we're scanning it for any unusual entries or any entries that may indicate an error or potentially fraud. Uh, not that we have any suspicion of that, but we are required to address the possibility. Uh, so these tests are designed to look for any indications of override of control, not that we necessarily think there are. A couple of other tests that we do, we test electronic payments and we test purchase cards. Purchase cards are pretty big with TCAPs. Um, so we certainly have a listing of all the P-card users within the district. Um, we pick a sample of those users uh, for one month and we'll look at their charges on the purchase card statements. We look to see, are they properly supported? Is it for a proper business purpose? And is it reviewed and approved? A couple of different tests that we do there in response to that risk of management override of controls. So those happened last week. Um, I've nothing to report in terms of exceptions or anything at this point related to that testing. The other big focus that we have during our preliminary audit field work is the single audit or the federal compliance audit uh, that TCAS will have again this year. You spend more than 750000 in federal funds, you're required to have that audit under the uniform guidance. So we do want to get as much as we can done uh, during our preliminary field work uh, so that when we come back in August, we're primarily focused on the financial statement audit piece of the engagement. For fiscal year 23, um, the two programs that we have selected to test are the Child Nutrition Cluster and the ESSER funds. Uh, both would be considered high-risk A programs. 
I'll get into a little bit of auditor speak here, but um, they haven't been tested uh, or child nutrition cluster hasn't been tested in the previous two years. That makes it an automatic high risk A program. Not that we think there's anything going on that would make it high risk. It's just based on our standards. If it hasn't been tested for two years and it's an A program, meaning it's more than 750,000 in expenditures, that makes it high risk. So we're testing that this year. ESSER is the second one that I mentioned. That's deemed higher risk um, by the U.S. Department of Ed and in the Uniform Guidance Compliance Supplement. So that will be tested this year as well. We've made really good progress on that. So I, I want to say thank you to the district uh, so far for all the help um, that we received last week during our preliminary field work. Um, so one thing to note too, in terms of the, the single audit or the federal compliance audit, we're testing compliance um, with the uniform guidance with the, the direct and material compliance requirements there. We're also testing the key controls. So you, you heard me mention we do the internal control walkthroughs um, related to the financial statements. In the single audit piece of the engagement, we're testing the key controls that are in place that are uh, related to the direct and material compliance requirements. So the big thing there is not only are we making sure that we're uh, complying with the requirements, but what are we doing to make sure that we comply? Well, those that's where controls come in. So we want to look to see that the controls are operating effectively and are documented. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, no no issues noted last week during our preliminary field work visit. Um, so we're off to a great start in terms of the audit for June 30, 2023. When we think about the financial statements for June 30, 2023, um, there is a new accounting standard that's effective. Uh, you may have heard me mention it uh, at some point last fall. It's GASB 96. It's the Subscription-Based Information Technology Arrangement Standard. Um, it mirrors the standard that was effective last summer for the district's financial statements, which would have been GASB 87 for leases. The accounting works pretty much the same way under GASB 96, uh, but it applies to a different set of agreements that pertain to information technology subscription-based agreements. Um, so we're working on pulling together the information that's needed uh, for that standard. Um, generally, we've seen curriculum be a pretty big one um, in districts. Um, oftentimes, things like um, the accounting software could fall under that new standard, um, a transportation software. But really, the key is if we have an agreement for an IT-based subscription software package. Um, that has to be greater than one year in terms of the term of the agreement, and it has to be material to the financial state. If we have those two things met and it meets the criteria for GASB 96, it then gets recorded uh, on the government-wide statement of net position, similar to how the leases were recorded. I mentioned earlier revenue recognition. Um, I'll just reiterate that that's always a big thing um, in a financial statement audit uh, in terms of making sure that revenue is recognized properly. Uh, so again, we will confirm federal, state, and, and property taxes uh, to make sure that that revenue is recognized properly. Also with TCAPs, as I'm sure everyone on the call is well aware, uh, capital projects, bond money, um, that's a big deal. Uh, so Section 1351A of the Revised School Code is what uh, is followed to make sure that those funds are spent properly, not only in accordance with 1351A, but also in accordance with the language that the voters approved in the bond document. So when we're doing a lot of that capital projects bond testing, which we did a lot of it during our, our visit last week, we're testing to make sure that those funds are being spent properly in accordance with Section 1351A as well as the bond document. The 2019 bond was fully spent at June 30, 2022. Um, looks like there was approximately 15 million remaining on the 2021 bond. And then we have the 2023 bond issued late in May uh, 2023. Um, so we do design our, our testing there accordingly. So we return the week of July 31 uh, to finish the audit. Um, probably look to, to finish our field work around August 10, maybe August 11. Um, and I think I've got the board meeting on our calendars for November 13, although we will confirm that date. 
I want to reiterate, thank you very much for all the help so far um, in this year's audit. Um, we certainly do appreciate the relationship where, um, you know, we can have an open book and have dialogue. So I do want to take a second to open it up. If anyone has questions um, related to the audit, uh, I'm happy to entertain those. I, I do have uh, one. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen, for that really helpful um, and thorough overview. I just wanted to ask to what extent TCAPS has cash receipts and cash disbursements, if you could quantify that and describe some of the activities, both receipts and disbursements. Yeah, that's a great question. So that, I mean, when you think of cash receipts or disbursements, that's really, that's cash coming in or going out of the district. It could be an electronic format. It could be um, actual cash received. Maybe it's an athletic event or some other sort of event that the district is putting on where cash is collected. Um, in terms of disbursements, again, those could be electronic. A lot of um, districts are moving more towards the electronic side of things, but also still could be a check. Um, so we do want to make sure that the, the process that's put in place by the district that has controls has proper segregation of duties. So it's not just one person in control of all the cash receipts, although that would be very difficult in a district the size of TCAPS. Um, we want to make sure it's also not one person in charge of outgoing payments. Uh, so we want to look to make sure that there's proper segregation of duties and that the controls that the district says they're doing are actually occurring and are being documented properly. Um, so, you know, there could be decentralized cash receipts. Um, that is an area that we've we've asked about in the past, primarily on athletics. We want to make sure that, you know, the, the ticket rolls that are going out are being double counted, that the cash that's coming in at the end of the athletic event is being double counted, that those counts are being documented, that the cash is making its way to the safe and being properly stored until the person takes it to the bank for deposit. Um, all things like that uh, related to cash receipts and disbursements. Is that help answer your question or yeah no thank you the the very first thing you said was that they can be electronic or checks so i think that you know i was thinking of cash just as in dollar bills and perhaps coins so that's a good clarification thank you sure no problem any other questions the only uh thing i was going to point out is um i did notice last week when they did field work i saw two new faces dave so two-thirds of our field team was brand new to tcap so i think that helps especially in the area of internal controls uh, they're learning our system and asking questions a little bit differently than somebody that has been here for a while would so i do appreciate that you do ro rotate some of the uh, field work out and bring in new faces dave i appreciate that Oh, sure. We're happy to do that. Thanks, Christine. That's a great point. Um, we do try to keep some fresh faces. Um, just as Christine, as you pointed out, it's maybe someone looks at something a little bit different and they can, you know, have a different eye on it and see something differently. You mentioned the new accounting standard. How, what's the difference between uh, the new GASB 96 and what you were using before? Sorry, it's a nerdy question. Oh, we, wasn't. Yeah, we didn't have anything for tech lease tech subscriptions. It's something new now that we have to um, put in our audit, uh, keep track of, and review. So it, that is a pretty pretty big lift to uh, go through that work. As was leases, but you know, come to find out, we don't have any, we don't have as many leases. We yeah. knew that going into it, but the tech world <laughs> and having subscriptions for services that's pretty big. I mean, everything that he mentioned as examples. Uh, transportation software curriculum has a lot uh, so that's going to be a big process for us to go through yeah yeah, yeah it is. I think that this standard is more impactful to districts than GASB 87 the least standard was mm -hmm. um, and it will it won't have a great impact at the fund level so that the day-to-day -day accounting the financial reports you see um, those items would have been previously expensed to purchase services. They may now be broken out as sort of a, a, a debt payment, if you will. It works the same way uh, at the fund level. It's more at the government-wide level that has uh, an impact on the statement of net position. And, and Mr. Nielsen, I just had one more question about the cash receipts and disbursements. Um, so even if your firm uh, doesn't find a material weakness or deficiency in terms of internal controls, would your firm be making recommendations to TCAPS if we're not, you know, um, embracing the latest best practices in that regard? 
Certainly. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's probably one of the, the best benefits of an audit. Um, it may be a tweak in how the process is done or a tweak in how the controls documented, but we are, you know, if we notice something, we would first talk with the district to make sure we're understanding it correctly. Because sometimes, believe it or not, we might not understand it the way we were supposed to understand it. And when we have that conversation, now we understand how it's supposed to be working. Um, so it, a lot of times it comes out as a general recommendation um, when we're talking with the district. And then we'll decide whether or not we want to put that into a management recommendation letter um, for that to be given to you as the board to read. Um, oftentimes, recommendations for cash receipts or disbursements do make their way into letters. Great, thank you. Sure. And then I, I just had one question for either yourself or Christine. Um, the, the child nutrition funds, is that typically over 750000 Since it hadn't been audited yeah. for two years, I wonder if we were it's like teeter federal on that. It's our federal funds for mm -hmm. whole food service operations. So yeah, it typically exceeds that. And it, and it just hadn't been audited as a type A fund in the past two years because you didn't need it to meet the threshold for coverage? Is Correct. That, okay. Yep, you, you got it. Yeah, we're usually, Title I is always way higher than that, so it's like picking of all yeah. of the highest ones. Well, and we hadn't had, it. we have S S or for yeah, the last couple of years, so that would be new. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Any final questions? No. I'm good. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and uh, attention to the details. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me today. And, and again, if, if questions come up after we get off the call, you always feel free to reach out. Um, I believe Christine has our contact information. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Um, all right, at this time, we will move on to procedural items. Uh, we are at the approval of the draft committee meetings uh, minute, meeting minutes from the prior meeting. Are there any changes to those? No. Nope. Hearing no changes, the minutes will remain as posted. Uh, moving on to informational items. Uh, first item under this is bus purchase. Christine. Yeah, so I would have liked to have this on as a procedural item so that it could be a recommendation moving on to the full board. I just don't have all of the information with me today, but I will have it prior to July 10th. So this is a little bit rushed and it is all due to the fact that we have heard there's a 2% increase coming for all school buses. And I think you can see in looking at the prices, there's already been major increases to bus prices. We used to be around 100,000 a bus and we're around 153. So um, Tyson and I had a conversation quite a while ago about um, looking at our bus purchases a little bit differently given the fact that we are um, building the bus wash and we do anticipate that we're going to be able to maintain and keep our buses a little bit longer than the 10 years we have in the past. With that being said, we looked at our fleet, we looked at our total number of routes and miles on buses and decided to only purchase five buses this year, knowing that it'll be the first round of buses that will actually be um, using this, the bus wash on a regular basis from the time that we receive them. And so the anticipation is these five will be kept for at least 13 years uh, going forward. So uh, we have in front of you as much information as possible and I will bring the remaining information for uh, discussion on July 10th for a recommendation. Um, when you look at um, utilizing um, the MSBO program, the bus purchase program, which does allow us to um, not necessarily skip the bidding process, they've done the bidding for us, so it's a consortium. Um, you're able to select uh, your information to a point and get a cost analysis, which you can see from the configured prices at the very bottom of page three, that Hoekstra is the cheapest. That's for the base level products that you can select. And then you need to reach out directly to the vendor for the added cost of the extras that the district itself would like to look at. So on the uh, fourth page, you can see there's a big gap to the right for Holland and Midwest. We don't have that information back from them. And so that's what I'm waiting for. Um, I anticipate having that in the next couple of days and we'll provide that to the full board once we have it uh, with a full recommendation. Right now, the recommendation would be to go to Hoekstra. We believe it'll still be the cheapest after you add all of those additional items because if you look at the initial cost, the base price, it is the cheapest. Um, the configured price, but we still will analyze that um, when we compare adding these items that we have selected to add to all of our school buses. 
Um, most of these are standard that we have had with the addition of a backup camera, um, which I will tell you, um, as a school bus driver, I really, really am excited about adding this feature. Um, it allows um, much more um, line of sight uh, when you have to back up a bus, and sometimes we don't have a choice, we have to back up a bus given some of the situations we're in. So that's the only thing that we have added that hasn't been part of our package uh, for the past several years. So surprising that those aren't required or standard. I know, I know. <laughs> and those are like about $767, it looks like from one company anyway. We yes. have that quote. Yeah, and we don't have it yet for the others, so yes. So I'm, I'm seeing on the first page of the quotes that the base price for Holland is less than Hoekstra, so I must be missing something. That is, the base price is before you actually make your selection on the chassis. Um, oh, okay. And so if you go to the bottom of the third page, that's the configured price with us selecting our chassis, okay. Okay. our engine. Um, so that's the, it's very, very close. Okay. But Hoekstra is the cheapest when you look at that. Mm -hmm. And we do like to configure it based on um, some of the additional things that we have had on our other buses as far as, um, you know, motors and chassis that we've already been working on. You know, we there is a benefit to staying with one company. Um, we have a parts room uh, out at transportation. They can use the same parts on all the school buses. The one thing that I have always appreciated that Hoekstra does, for one, they provide the additional training every time there's any kind of upgrades to their um, diagnostic systems. And they also will send our technicians to their base, which I think is in North Carolina, for on-site testing at no cost to us. In addition, they allow us to do warranty work ourselves and get reimbursed directly from Holstra, which has been an added benefit. Um, it really decreases our downtime with our school buses. Mm -hmm. And our technicians have the skill set to do that work. So we've always appreciated that ability. So right now it's information. What's the lead time, do you know? The lead time for the school buses? Yeah. I mean, are they available um, relatively soon? You know, I'd, I'd, I think I was so concerned about getting it ordered <laughs> before the 2% increase, I didn't even ask. Yeah. Um, but I will find that out prior to Ju July 10th. It's generally a while. I was going to say, I assume it was. We usually order in December for a July delivery. So we're just uh, we're just way off on our timing this year because of that increase coming so normally i wouldn't take this until late in the year and we'd get it next july did you happen to ask what's causing a 35 or 40 percent increase no <laughs> it's across I mean, the board I, I know yeah. but it just seems you know a lot of it i will tell you it's been kind of creeping up everything is going electronic um and that every time that every time something switches to being electronic based the cost seems to go up yeah. So uh, it does look like um, w the difference between the base price with the chassis that you've chosen, um, Hookster's the cheapest, and then it's about $14,000 more for all the options. Yes. So you're probably anticipating Holland and Midwest Transit will add a commensurate amount. Yes. And that Hookster will still end up being the cheapest overall. That's my... If it doesn't, though, and because you're trying to get this process by June 30th, yes. right, so that... To avoid the, then what ha, how, how if does it's that close us? I will still recommend Hoekstra because of the added benefits that I just mentioned like being able to do warranty work we'll clarify with Holland and Midwest if they allow that as well but if it's very close we would still recommend maintaining Hoekstra mm -hmm. um, because of the part situation um, and all of the extras that they provide that there isn't a dollar attached to it okay. it would have to be a, a big difference for us to recommend else something else Right, and they're they're okay then basically with you entering this contract pending board approval July 10th. Yeah, honor. that's normal protocol, okay. so yes. Okay, so yep. this this is the amount for five buses? Yes. Okay, I'm looking at it and it says quantity one, and I'm like, mm. No, oh. no, it, it, the dollar this, amount is for 77 one, right? passenger. Yeah, the, the total price at the bottom, the 153 is per bus. Yeah. The total on the memo, um, oh, I didn't even, I didn't put it because it's not a recommendation. It's like seven hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay. So yeah. Why wow, those diesel buses are starting to sound less? Uh, it's not a multiple you know, of three. It's a multiple of two. It is, but I will tell you the um, electric buses have gone up, and a lot of them that got the the grant that have gotten them, they're down. They're not able to keep them running. Yeah. They're having serious issues with. Them. Mm. 
we're seeing it statewide, like in our things, like uh, some of the, the Metro Detroit areas, they've hardly had them on the road because they broke down so often. The technology, I'm afraid, is just not quite yeah. there yet on them. I think it will be, but it's just not quite there yet. Right. Are they still at about 300,000? Or? They're 400,000. Oh, so they've increased yeah. too, big yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank Any you. Any additional questions? Uh, if not, we will move on to capital project update. <laughs> All right, we're going to start out at uh, West Senior High today. This is the West uh, Athletic Complex. You can see it's come along quite a ways. Um, we uh, did have some problems with the rain here this last week. We've got a little bit of washout work that we've got to take care of, but uh, things are moving along quite well out there. A lot of the concrete work's done. The infields, the outfields are uh, ready for uh, hydro seeding, and that little bit of concrete work left up at the uh, uh, field house, the doors in, the windows are in. Um, you know, it's getting close. And while we're at West Senior High, this is the turf uh, project uh, on the field. It is ready for turf. That's the stone that's down. Turf's coming uh, July eighth, I believe it was. So the white part, that's stone. On the yeah, floor? that's uh, that's the drainage stone underneath. All rolled and all sculpted. Uh -huh. Ready to go waiting for the turf to show up, the carpet. And then still at West Senior High, this is the weight room before we started knocking walls down. And uh, this is the locker room that's been cleared out, part of it. And that's that wall, that, that big green wall that's missing. Um, they're moving along out there. And then expanding it out. So. And over at Central High, this is the turf project at Central. Um, the idea was this would follow along behind West Senior High, so as they got a little bit later start because of the Bayshore Marathon. So uh, the stone is there. If you drive by on Millican Avenue, you can see it piled up out front. But there were the trucks bringing it in. And the tennis courts. Um, oh, wow. Fences are up. Uh, they've started uh, painting uh, the surfaces. This is a little bit later in the week. Um, Even see different the today, they were there painting. So. Yep. Yeah, they've been there. They, they've been there off and on. There's, yeah. Yeah, they, they haven't maintained a steady schedule there, but uh, they're getting the work done. And um, we got uh, this is the uh, ISD edition or the NWES edition at Trav Heights. We got final uh, uh, certificate of occupancy on that, so they can fully use that space now. And so we're starting on the, uh, or we got started on the other part of a, a phase two, which is a renovation to the parking and uh, the drive off of uh, Rose Street. And then the interior renovations got started, taking out the uh, existing office walls, clearing out spaces, getting ready to uh, put in the new construction. East Middle School still hanging out there. Um, slow to close this one out a little bit because we added some things at the very end, some additional drops in that. So they had to do another four floor slab cut. And, and that's for and digital that, media, right? Digital yeah, media. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say this looks familiar from the DPAA presentation. Yep. So, but it's it's pretty well done. A little bit of cleanup left and some floor tile to put down. And over at transportation, uh, this, this changes very rapidly. <laughs> this was um, Monday. This was Tuesday, and today they're going to finish the paving out in the in the south half, the south parking lot there. Um, this is coming off of uh, off of uh, Cass Road on the backside, and they've started demolition on the inside of the building for the bus wash. And Montessori. This will be the last time I'll show Montessori at this meeting. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did you just yeah, okay. make a grand You got the playground <laughs> approved, so we're... That's right. Playgrounds also... Ready yep. for chips to go in, eh? Yeah. Ready, for, All right. ready for stone and chips. Yep. All the new so, rules. And I'll give a shout-out to uh, Thomas Palacci. He uh, took his drone out and flew it at night to get me these shots. I was just going to ask a tough question. Who was operating this yeah. drone? So, Thomas got out Those there. Those are nice pictures. Yep. Yeah, they are. Took some good shots for us. Oh, really nice. Has there been any further discussion with the township out there about Frankie Road? About fixing it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Or just, just I, try, like, 
we yeah. keep having the same conversation. It's on their list. Is it? Because last time I looked at their <laughs> website, it was not on their list, on their list for this before. summer. Or say, a, no, it's not on their list to get done right away. It's on their list, yeah. meaning who knows how far Three down years it is. out, yeah. Okay. So other than those, um, we've got a few projects that are just starting the clinic at West Middle School, uh, some of the HVAC plumbing upgrades um, around the district, and then we're doing a little bit of work for NWES, uh, a couple of spaces at Oak Park and Central High. Those will be... Hopefully in the next next month when we uh, go through those, they're just getting started. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? All right. Um, we will move on to the strategic plan update. Yeah. So as it relates to our um, goal, uh, develop a three to five year facilities plan to provide optimal student learning environments. We actually have a three prong approach to that. Uh, from a facilities perspective, we have a contract with Dr. Shannon Flummerfelt, who has worked with the district since 2011 on lean pack practices of improvement. Um, she is working directly with the facilities department on continuous improvement, and I have some uh, further information on that here in a minute. Um, we are also doing pre-bond planning with Deacon Mahaman and Miller Davis, which is ongoing. And then we also are working with TRAIN on performance management. Um, they actually were just in the district last week doing their assessments. So it's a three-prong approach. It all has to do um, with a facilities plan. Um, so we are kind of looking at these in, in separate areas that kind of all connect together. So in some respect, we're looking at continuous improvement in facilities and creating standards for buildings that will then lead into some bond planning. So it's all, all, all interconnected. Uh, the work that Shannon is doing, she actually started in October last year and um, is just now wrapping up on an audit process. So what we asked her to do um, was an analysis of our current state, so really understanding what we have as far as our facilities and our programming uh, for custodial and the trades, um, and to kind of look at a, a problem statement, and then to uh, pilot um, some of the recommended uh, solutions to problems. Um, so that took place October to January. She physically has been in every building and met with every lead custodian um, and works very closely with the, um, the facilities managers. So in February, she actually started to deploy audits. So they created an audit system um, where she was coming in to do those audits on things they had agreed to maintain. Um, there was a checklist that was created uh, weekly and a monthly checklist, and our managers meet with those lead custodians to go through those checklists together as far as walking the building and marking items that need attention. Um, we have somewhat gotten away from a very clear work order system where uh, people are putting things in because at some point, maybe you thought you put it in a couple years ago and it didn't get done. So we're trying to kind of start over fresh with the expectation that the work order is done. This is the expectation in the building. And this is how we'd like you to follow up on that. Um, so she did that work, um, really looking for an 85% defect free exterior and interiors. Um, we are finding, obviously, throughout the district that we have very different um, uh, different standards per building um, as it relates to the exteriors and the interior, uh, flooring, landscaping, um, irrigation, everything is different. And so really what we came to start now as phase three is developing standards of use. Um, it is very difficult for the enormity of our facility staff to make determinations on priorities when there aren't standards that have been developed and understood district-wide. And so that's the work that she's starting to do. She'll be interviewing principals, um, administrative team members to kind of talk about what that might look like going forward. And a lot of that work will feed right into our bond planning. So we have already determined, obviously, through safety and security that that um, secure entrance vestibule is a standard. So leading into bond planning, what do we need to plan for the sites that don't have that? That needs to be a project. Um, we've talked about another example would be um, having snow melt in front of exterior doors at the main entry to protect the doors. Not every site has that. If they need it, how does that get into a bond program and what does that look like as far as priority goes? So those are the conversations right now that we're talking about. Um, we, I do plan 
plan to uh, bring her to the August 2nd uh, board finance so she can bring um, some of the findings from the conversation around standards of use to the board um, and then also could present at August 16th for a final set of recommendations. Um, at the end of the day, we're looking for a nod from the board that we're heading in the right direction because it will then dictate how we move forward in priorities and when people ask for projects, whether or not we say yes or no and why. Um, so we're looking for that clarity so that we can move forward all on the same page and that we don't necessarily have the haves or have nots. Everybody has provided the same thing and there's a filter system to make those decisions. Um, so that's the work that she's been doing. These are just some things that um, she's finding as she's going through the buildings. Um, uh, Having clarity around roles for the leads um, is very important. Sometimes it's very, very difficult for a lead custodian that works directly with a principal every day, that, but technically they report to the facilities department. They have to make sure that they have a good working relationship with the principal so that if there's something that is required to be done and they're getting pulled away from that, that there's a good way to have a conversation with the building principal about would like to help you with X, Y, and Z. However, these are things that are required that I'm to do. Um, some of the stuff is uh, chemical testing for boilers and there's a lot that needs to be done that the facilities department will oversee with the custodian, but we still want that good working relationship with the building principal. We just have to make sure we understand what that means. Um, so we've been looking at contracted services. Um, I think a while back we shared the difficulty in our, our labor force, um, both with bus drivers and facilities. Um, so we have decided to uh, contract some services to allow our staff to focus on more um, individualized projects um, and standards. So we have some lawn mowing contracts, which you know, I will tell you that's not necessarily the easy answer because they're struggling with staff too. So now we just have to try to hold the co uh, contractor accountable for the mowing. So um, we're looking at all avenues to be able to get the work done and to provide that um, exterior vantage point that is inviting and welcoming. Um, and that's something that we need to define what that looks like. Christine, can I just pause for a second and ask you about um, uh, the contractor? It's a contractor for this, right? Yep, yep. So it, was she hired because um, that's a best practice to get somebody independent of district or because we don't have the in-house expertise? It's because both, really. Um, the benefit with her is she knows the district very well. So she actually started in 2011 with lean training, just, just bringing lean training into the district and the practices associated with that. Um, it was very much, um, it became a part of our practice, at least on the operational side, to use lean practices. Uh, but we've gotten away from it just the nature of time. So everybody at one time was trained in lean, and sometimes now when you talk about lean, people don't even know some of the terminology because they haven't been trained. Um, but she talks about the 5S mm -hmm. standard. You know, um, I wrote down every single S that it stands for, but I don't know offhand. But having a conversation about storage, like why do we have all this stuff? Have you sorted it? Have, uh, have we talked about the expectations? Have we made sure that it's... Uh, ready to go have we standardized that process so you know even with our move from Glen Loomis to Montessori we had this conversation like you need to be able to sort what's staying what's going why have we been keeping this for so long it, you know we have furniture that is slightly broken but people are keeping it because they don't want to throw it away so having that system set up um, so that it's sustainable so custodians know if it's x y and z it stays it goes or they make a phone call to a supervisor to find out uh, the resolution for that so really trying to put standards in place um, so it's not just a lead custodian on their own trying to make a decision they have something uh, to explain what that looks like. So having a standard about how hallway clutter, well, we have egress and emergency evacuation rules and regulations we have to abide by. Do they all understand what that is and what it should look like? Um, so that's just really using lean processes. And she really kind of started out in the, um, I would say manufacturing realm and has really started doing more work for schools. Um, but it, it's very helpful on the operational side. It relates to people, it makes sense. Um, and so just incorporating those thoughts and ideas uh, with somebody that has a, a good knowledge of TCAP's history over the past um, 10 plus years, so. Great, thank you. How does longevity affect not ice cream? The ice cream? <laughs> so I'm looking I at caught that, that too. That? Okay, so there, there's been a long-standing color of our walls called ice cream. 
Nobody likes it, but it was at one point our standard because we didn't want to have multiple, it's this color here yeah. that's very boring, and it shows a lot of uh, marks. Well, at some point, um, we had a conversation around why, why is that our standard? Why can't we change it? Well, we certainly don't want anybody and everybody to pick any color and then try to maintain paint that can be reusable elsewhere. So looking at creating a new standard, mm -hmm. um, it's actually, we've lo been looking a lot at this more subtle gray because it doesn't show as many marks, but allowing people to pick colors with a limit, um, uh, it, that's kind of been the conversation. Okay. Like people are sick of ice cream, but to open it Pandora's box and allow for anything and everything can kind of also create a nightmare. So um, it's a conversation piece. Like we've had that at West. It's just been interesting to talk about what is dark green. Right. Yeah, what is right. their actual? And there's about 92 colors of green. So I will say Paul, like when we did the band towers, he has a very clear protocol of what West green is with a Sherwin-Williams number with it of what that color is, so that when we're able to send that to the, the company, yeah. we were able to give them exactly what that green should be as a standard. You know? And we also, like we have people that want to paint themselves. Well, there's a standard for what kind of paint we have. Um, so there, there's just standards that we need to create and then we need to have a conversation about what we allow above and beyond. Um, because it can, you can get away from your mission very quickly if you, don't have those standards in play and people aren't using them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, nobody likes the color ice cream anymore and so we're <laughs> evaluating like, that. It's like antique white slash yeah. landlord yeah. white. <laughs> and someday <laughs> light gray will be unpopular too. It yeah. will, but we've, we're trying to create a couple of options that isn't yeah. so boring. <laughs> right. Not but honestly. Ours is agreeable gray. Agreeable gray, yeah. <laughs> I know that color. <laughs> Um, so that's the work um, with Shannon, and right now um, she is working on, um, since most of our principals are done for the summer, we're working on like a Google survey just to try to get perceptions on what they believe is a standard or would agree to as a standard in a building. Um, the conversation always from the facilities perspective is district-wide. Well, sometimes it's really hard to explain to a principal, you don't get the extra because this, this other building doesn't even have the standard yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to get everybody on the same page for all of our schools should have that. And if they don't, they should then be the priority to get that before anything is asked for above and beyond. So creating the awareness, getting some conversation around what it should and shouldn't look like. Um, and moving forward with that into bond planning. There was, uh, you had parts B and C, right? With this, with the last piece being the train. Did mm -hmm. you have anything? That's, yep, I'm not there yet, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the okay. next part is pre-bond planning. So this is the other, um, other leg of the three-legged stool for the three to five year facility plan. Um, this is our current timeline. We just recently revised the timeline so that I could begin to provide some assessment reports at this meeting. Um, we had a lot of conversation. Uh, we actually meet bi-weekly with the whole entire team. Um, and we had a lot of conversation around not wanting August 16th to be very overwhelming for board members. So the more we can start to provide some assessments and information ahead of time, the more maybe comprehensive the conversation can be at August 16th. And so I've added in two dates today to start sharing some of the um, assessments that uh, the findings of the assessments and then again at August 2nd. Um, and then a full-fledged uh, report out on the 16th of all of the information. Um, so we've added that. This, this is posted on our website. Um, so when we look at the draft assessments so far, one of the difficulties we had was uh, whether or not we categorize things by building or by trade. We actually chose to go by trade. For one thing, um, I wanted to try to make sure that it was looking at the needs of the district, district-wide, and prioritizing by those things that will end up being called a, a priority one. Um, so we just kind of started off looking at um, the way that we had developed the RFP, we asked the architect and engineer to do two, two assessments, the facility assessment and the programming assessment. So having a conversation with students and teachers about how does the program in this facility work or doesn't work for you and what could we do to elevate that. Um, then we ask them to, as part of that, do the facility assessment, and that's where they're going through everything, the building envelope, heating and cooling, every, every engineer was through the building with a fine tooth comb. So we ask them to do that, and then um, we use certain terminology, so I want to just share that with you so that you're seeing that it connects to the way that we put the RFP out. So we did ask them to identify upgrades. Upgrades are considered uh, necessary for acceptable operation, 
um, of any type of uh, piece of equipment. So if it's recommended for an upgrade, it means that you need this upgrade to continue to operate the facility. Um, so you'll see upgrade boilers. Obviously, that's because they're at their end of the use for life and why we need to upgrade them is so that we can maintain a safe uh, learning environments for students and staff. So some of this terminology, when you see upgrade, it's not upgrade just because uh, we want to upgrade it. It's upgrade because it's necessary because it's either at its end of useful life or it will be in a certain period of time throughout our bond program. So um, the listed upgrades uh, that I'm gonna show you are not specific to buildings, but they are listed by trade. Um, and it looks like this. So um, at the August 16 meeting, they'll actually have cost assessments with each one of these, um, and they can break it down by building if you would like to look at it this way. Uh, but right now, these are the high level issues that they have found as part of their facility assessment. Um, so stormwater drainage upgrades for playgrounds. This is a pretty big issue at almost every single one of our elementary buildings. Uh, septic systems at the rural sites, um, you'll see that. So um, in the grand scheme of things, I guess what I'm trying to show is as part of priority one, meaning um, it's necessary to maintain an open facility or it's critical for life and security, safety, um, what I'm trying to start showing now is the enormity of the things that are required um, and will be priority one as it relates to just keeping the building open and operational. So these are items that aren't necessarily fun to fund or fun to talk about or plan, but these are items that will be on a priority one list coming forward to the board with dollar amounts attached to it. Um, and I, I was looking for a little bit of feedback on if you thought it was necessary to have by building or just by trade. Um, if we have several stormwater drainage issues to upgrade for playgrounds, do we need to say Cortate is this much or do we just need to say for all elementary schools, we need 1.3 million to be able to upgrade these drainage systems so water's not pooling and freezing in the winter. Would you be able to provide the information at the summary level for each school? So yeah. in, instead of like, underneath that first bullet, you know, 16 buildings sub bulleted just separately have like, they have it portrayed, yep. you know, everything on, up on here. And then yep, we can have it both every, ways. You know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think it's important definitely at least to have a number, especially like, you know, are you talking two buildings? Are you talking 12? Yeah. You know, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. I think it would be nice to see a summary for each building. Yeah. I, my, my initial thought was, um, it would be nice to see what they came up with for especially like central grade school mm -hmm. that we know like you know are we going to do a bunch of um you know upgrade work when we know that the whole building itself might be up for the full discussion of everything upgrade yeah <laughs> um, right. you know so that might be nice to see yeah. what is specifically related just i mean the other buildings obviously those are those are ongoing you know and i think it might yeah. be good to know the, the number of buildings that you know need a new boiler um but yeah i would think that for central specifically central grade school specifically like it might be nice to know just by school that mm -hmm. specific school we'll have option. to we'll have to have a further conversation because because we know that building needs to be redone there isn't there we didn't ask them to go above and beyond with the assessments what we can ask them to do though is say and that's perfect this I mean, boilers I, end of life is this date mm -hmm. our in, in our opinion yeah. the end of life for this boiler has probably been surpassed but um so they can give that information. We didn't ask them to go through specific systems knowing that the whole thing needed to be okay. redone. And that's good. That I mean, okay. that was kind of what I thought maybe. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot. I, can't, I mean, I'm just trying to think in my mind what like, you know, would not be needed to be in an upgrade yeah. situation. Like there's a couple few bathrooms that have been done. Yeah. yeah. You know, but. But there wouldn't be, I mean, so any, and, and here's another thing to tie into. When we talk about standard, building standard use, we wouldn't recommend doing those things knowing that it would have to be rip, uh, ripped up right. and redone when right. we get to the building. So mm -hmm. the secure entrance vestibule, it's not the same as others, but they have one. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have sidewalk melt. We don't recommend tearing that up and redoing it because we will be a, a, you know, doing the building. The boiler, it's technically at its useful life. We will continue to operate it as much as we can until we get to the plan to mm -hmm. have the full-fledged overhaul at Central Grade. But roof, any idea how old the roof is? I don't. 
So, interrupt. but these are things that you're going to see. We can do it by building and by trade, and they'll put a number to it. Right. Um, I'm trying to at least entertain. There, I think there's a lot on here that that people are going to be like, man, we we got to spend a lot of our money on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to at least bring to the table so it's not a complete shock that we need a lot of money for some general yeah. upgrades to maintain operations. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the elementary and secondary school buildings, um, are, did they also include Boardman yes. and Sabin and yes. Oak Park and, yep. and Glen Loomis? Even? Yep, okay. all of them. Okay, so everything but central grade, yes. sounds like. Yeah. They still went through central grade and they'll have some items. It's just not gonna be very detailed. Yeah. 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 So one of the things that they have found in a lot of our buildings, um, not having roof hatches on the interior of the building, um, and so there's a recommendation to make a standard for that. Um, we do have some secure ladders on the outside of the building for staff, but we've also had some slips and falls. And so um, looking at creating a standard with the work that they're doing with facilities continuous improvement of making a standard that every building has an internal roof hatch to be able to access the roof for safety purposes. And so that would be something that would be incorporated into bond planning with a cost per building. Um, and you said these are all priority one, right? They so they the still blue. need to do that work. Um, I, they will not all be priority one, but the majority. The like classroom furniture is not likely to be priority one unless it's broken or failing. Um, that it, That is on here specifically from programming audits. Um, but majority of this you can see, uh, you know, drinking fountains, it, it might not necessarily be a priority one. Uh, because, because we have an operational one, but it's not the one that we're moving to that has a bottle filler. So that wouldn't be priority one, but most of everything on here would be. Mm -hmm. Unit ventilators, hot water boilers. Um, I was looking hot at water like, the heaters. toilet room fixtures. Yeah. Are we talking about like the flushing? You're talking lever doesn't the flooring, work. the toilet, the sinks, everything. Um, we have a lot of buildings that they're going to make a recommendation to upgrade main distribution and branch circuit panel boards for electrical. Um, you're going to you're going to see some big big price uh, items on some of this. Emergency lighting panel boards. Um, there's just some really outdated systems that they'll be making recommendations on a priority one or two list. Let me just review what that means here. So priority one, issues that need immediate attention, uh, potential health or safety issue or failure. Um, priority two would be in need of attention in one to two years. The one to two years they're looking at is really from a 24 to 24, 26 year span, 2024 to 2026 would be priority two. And then priority three would be not essential for operation, but required in the next few years. So if we really look at this bond potentially being uh, maybe a six to eight year bond. I'm not so sure that anything that any money we get would be really would last 10 years, given that we would have central grade included. If we have a six to eight year bond, would it need to be done in that time frame, or is it something that can be on the list for a potential next bond vote? So that's how we've asked them to categorize it. So a lot of the items that you just saw would likely be priority one or two, probably not the furniture, but a lot of the other items. And will they evaluate the community input as well? Yes. Uh, suggestions that yep. we've gotten already yep. um, in those three categories. Okay. A lot of the community input isn't specific to items that you would see them put in the priorities. It will be community input on the bond as a whole, depending on how we ask the question. So you'll see from the um, survey a summary of the percentage of the community that felt like 3.1 mils, maintaining that was important. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that percentage. So all of that information is to help guide not just the projects, but how we sell the bonds and when. Yeah. So for instance, you don't get really a lot of feedback of replace the boilers, mm -hmm. replace the electrical, right, you right. Know, that of the priorities, but some yeah. of the other. The I was thinking there, yeah. of things that students and parents see regularly, which is like the central high school wrestling room. We got, yes. we've gotten a lot yeah, of yeah. feedback. So, you know, would, I was wondering if the architects and engineers would say, yes, we definitely need to, this is a priority one or priority yeah. two in their assessment. Um, they wouldn't say it's specific to the community feedback, but that's on their list at Central High School based on the programming and facility assessment they did, and it would be okay. labeled then as priority one or two. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
So a lot of the a lot of the stuff coming up first is not going to be terribly exciting, but you know I I just can't um, I can't reiterate enough how far behind we are not passing a bond in 12 and 14. Um, it, it feels like you know 2018 we were behind and doing projects as fast as we could, but then also got the safety and security kind of put in front of a lot of things. So um, we we still feel like we're behind on some. I won't say general maintenance because general maintenance isn't bondable, but new roofs, new boilers, water heaters, like those things need to be replaced and upgraded to maintain um, an operational facility and we're behind. So that's what that will look like. Um, I did put in front of you, have Stacy print out and put in front of you because for some reason when we transferred it over, it didn't really print, uh, show up so well on a slide but um, this is a document that our um, uh, architect and construction management team have created um, just so that the board can stay in tune to everything that we're doing as it relates to pre-bond planning um, so this is an outreach and engagement um, summary of activities and um, I also put on the uh, um, agenda survey audience just sharing with you that you can see when we did those surveys the TCAP staff survey had a 317 responses um, the specific facility feedback survey had 147 responses the community and parent survey had 1127 and the TCAP student survey had uh, 580 uh, responses which I thought was pretty significant so we're using this document to document every time we're in front of the community or every time there's an opportunity for the community to reach out to the board or attend a meeting. Um, we did our informational sessions at every building. We had two evening events where we shared information. We've done press releases. We've done social media. Um, we continued to have each school put in their newsletter ongoing information, especially reminders about participating in the survey. Um, we've done some um, actual community presentations, um, music boosters, the central neighborhood, and some other um, entities have allowed us to present to their group and share information. Um, and then obviously all of our Board of Education meetings, which anytime we talk about this or provide any information, this is, um, that's a live um, open public meeting for people to participate. And then we did um, fortunately get some media play too as it relates to uh, the pre bond planning uh, contract and the survey. So that was nice. Christine on the Board of Education, um, it just happens to be me for office hours this month and it's on the 27th. It says 720 on this document. So oh. just FYI. Okay. Where are you? It's on the 27th. That's what's on my calendar. Okay. 727 you're saying versus yes. 720? Correct. Okay. Oh, the office hours? Yeah. I will get that corrected. And it is me, so I'm happy to talk about that. That's why you noticed. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, Christine, I was just curious about the informational sessions um, that were after school on May 1st and 2nd at various buildings. It says it varied by school. Um, that was for staff and families. Can you give us an idea of the range of turnout at those? Yeah, I would say um, no one to maybe 20. Um, we, mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not much participation more staff than families or vice versa um i would say it was a, a pretty even mix that i think the, the east middle school may have had more staff than than parents um but most of the other ones there wasn't enough really participation to say if it was heavier one way or the other mm -hmm. yeah go ahead do you know on the on the surveys themselves were these unique responses or did some like were some community parents also staff? Uh, we wouldn't really be able to tell if they were filling it out. Well, yes, we can because it says right on there. Um, do you are you able to click on these and we can just show them? I just I mean if we had over 2, you know two thousand unique responses. We, that's a what lot. we did is they weren't you know you you didn't identify you only you had a separate link if you were a staff person yeah. a separate link. So I mean, but we did ask them in the survey itself mm -hmm. who they are, and you can see, like overwhelmingly, we had a big um, parent response, mm -hmm. but we had a pretty big response from community members that have no ties to the district. Yeah. Surprisingly, wow. So and you like, have to put in a, a a Google email, right? It's linked to Gmail, I think. 
So you can tell from unique no. email no. addresses. No, no not that's how it showed it up just, for me. You had to have a G account, but it doesn't yeah. record what you know what one it was. And oh, yours was probably because okay. you were on our system, so it mm -hmm. recognized you automatically. It's completely anonymous mm -hmm. for any outsider, and it wouldn't require any kind of. You so could just click on the link yeah. and take it. You could have somebody submit People. multiple, but, but even, like even I said, still, I mean, we, we had. But by doing different too. links, it would discourage for the most part because right. like staff could only access it through their, you know, their their link on mm -hmm. their on their right. Chromebook. So I, I don't. Um, if you, I would have to log in as myself to look at it, but. Um, we can certainly share the raw data at any time. Yeah. I was just pointing out that, you know, over 2,000 responses is it's quite great. a... It yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. was really impressed with this. I think our staff, it's kind of funny, the staff amount was lower than the student amount, but I'm pretty sure the student amount was high because the staff pushed it. Yes. Like, asked people to do yes. it. So it's kind yeah. of... Kind of comical. Amount. Those uh, civics teachers, probably. Yeah, yeah. All <laughs> oh, the kids that have been the board meeting, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, well, whatever it takes. And that's just secondary students, too. Yeah. And there, there were some open-ended questions where you you have a lot of responses that's going to be hard mm -hmm. to decipher from. Mm -hmm. um, but you guys will get the raw data, too. Will they group or cluster categorize those as much as open they can. responses yeah, yeah. as okay. much as they can decipher what mm -hmm. some of them I don't make a lot of sense so <laughs> that was probably mine <laughs> 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 strategic planning responses. and some are just opinions about something to do with the school system not necessarily bond planning, right so right and then and Dr. Van Wagener you had mentioned previously that you would you were planning to do more information sessions for the community after the board retreat, right? So after August, have when a we get bit a little bit more dialed down some thoughts and some mm -hmm. questions the board will have, I expect. And you can see already we have some scheduled um, that we're already trying to get on, on some of the books, like the Rotary Club, you know, like that we can't even get in there till like September, some of those like that, that, you know, we're trying to even presentations at this point that we're trying to get scheduled for after that point. Mm -hmm. And I would ask the board August 16 for direction on if they needed anything because really until there's a decision about what to do, there wouldn't be a full press for an informational campaign. Once it's determined how much we're going to ask for and when and what some of the highlighted projects are, then it's a full out informational campaign to make sure people are aware. It would really be determined by that August 8 to see what board feels they would need. Yeah, like, you know, the the 800 pound gorilla central grade it, so at what point would we want to get more community input about so i think options i there? think when you look at the survey results you'll be pleased to see that the general public agrees we need to do something and they want a school there which i think will guide the board in making a decision to move forward um so we tried to ask some very vague questions so that you at least had some guidance moving forward on whether or not to plan to have it as part of the projects and whether or not to fund it. Mm -hmm. um, the overwhelming majority believe that, that we should maintain some of the historic nature, but there's a recognition that some of it can't be. Um, you still need to make sure you have a 21st century learning uh, situation with lighting upgrades and, and, and there's a recognition too that there's a need to um, have um, better drainage for snow melting and just better drainage on the site. There's a need for an actual bus loop and maybe some parking. So um, I think that overall there was a feeling that um, Lars Hockstead is important, Central Grade is important, some preservation of historic nature is important, but there's an overwhelming please redo the building. And I think those are pieces that the board needs to move forward. Um, actually designing it would come later, obviously with vision, vision sessions once we actually have the money to do something with the building. Yeah, so I, I apologize if I'm being dense here, but just so for board for voters to understand um, and TCAP's ability to advertise the bond next year and, and what the vision is, at what point do we get the community input on, you know, do we renovate this entire building? Do we renovate the historic and, you know, have to lob off part of the building or do we demolish it all and rebuild from new, like those would, options. Yeah, you would get that after you actually secure the money and you would start like vision sessions where you invite okay. community, parents, um, much like we did with Montessori. And I, I think maybe 
you I don't think you were on the board at that point but no. we have a visioning session that's usually overseen by a third party expert and we go through uh, standards for the building and what people are looking for and you have a good perspective of the community not only people that attend the building uh, but mm -hmm. taxpayers um, we usually have like city officials county officials township officials if it's related to that facility we did it at Eastern we did it at Montessori um, it's really deciding what are the priorities for the building okay and then and that's when they okay. would get into and then they would present that as far as the bigger as part of the bigger picture too because there's gonna be huge variance in costs right between those right. options like yeah, if all we... of that information would be presented to the okay. board and the board would make a decision on how we're moving forward so the architect can move forward with renderings right but at this point it's it'll be clear to you when you look at the raw data from the surveys that the general community wants a school there. Mm -hmm. They want some historic preservation, but there's an understanding that we need to do more than that. And maybe that doesn't mean maintaining the whole entire building as it sits right now, right. which I think will help moving forward. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I heard a lot about that at the board office hours this past <laughs> week. This yeah. Yeah, it was our, our the person who likes to email regularly. Oh. oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. But good points. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third leg of the stool is performance management. So we are working with train. They were actually throughout all of our buildings uh, last week. They uh, thought they might have to come back next this week, but they didn't need to. Um, they have actually been um, analyzing utility bills, uh, three years worth of utility bills. It'll be their um, job, if you will, to make recommendations on uh, projects that have a um, reasonable payback. So by doing this project, you're gonna save on your operational costs, therefore it makes sense to move forward because here's the payback. Um, and they guarantee that work. So it'll be up to them to come up with that, what that program looks like and how we can fund it. Um, and uh, they know our target uh, date to having something like this ready to go would be around next summertime. So they're doing all of their analysis right now um, as it relates to going through the buildings. Uh, we did ask them to focus the majority of their time on um, the secondary schools, just knowing that they, they look, likely will find enough at the secondary schools um, to make a project that might be acceptable to start as early as next year. Um, so they're doing that work, which is nice. It's, um, they're kind of duplicating some work that we've asked our uh, architects and construction manager to do. So it's nice that we have kind of two opinions on a lot of the work. Um, we did also ask them to focus some time at uh, Glen Loomis, just knowing that we need to do some work before we house central grade there. Um, so they've done that. So this is the presentation that they came, Correct. I don't yep. know, 12, yep. 18 months ago. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we'll have the their findings as another source of information. Yeah, I'm not sure that we'll have all of their recommendation by August 16th, because um, uh, it, it really is treated as something a little bit separate, um, but um, it is part of the three to five year facility plan, which isn't necessarily tied just to this year. But any recommendations we get ahead of time, we'll share them. Excellent. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, let's see. Moving on to uh, property offer updates. Yes. So I just wanted to kind of let you know where I'm at and what I'm planning uh, for July 10th. Uh, so as it relates to the Boardman offer, um, I have worked with the gentleman that made the offer. They will be present at the July 10th board meeting, as will our attorney, who is also a commercial real estate agent. Um, and uh, he has uh, asked uh, a company out of Lansing that does specific Michigan school uh, appraisals to put together an expert opinion on all of our appraisals. Um, he has also asked us to send information. I think Paul sent about 84 pages of information as it relates to environmental um, reports related to the building. Um, I also have reached out to Kevin Endress at Three West. He's willing to put together um, in writing um, not necessarily a recommendation, but things to consider for the board to consider when they're looking at this offer. Um, I also uh, will be getting the same thing from Doug Luciani at Cunningham Limp. Um, and we do have a comparable offer just to have a conversation about as it relates to working with IFF on the housing project. Um, the other proposal was 620,000 for this building to create 20 units. So to be clear, that was the Blair project I'm working on. 
they did throw this building in the mix and they did get one other groups also put something in for here to give an idea as another possibility for the board. So in addition to all that, I am working um, with Paul on um, our construction manager is putting together estimates for renovation uh, for moving this uh, moving administration in the print shop. Um, very basic timeline and cost estimates to move printing to Sabin and to move administration to Glen Loomis. So I will have all of that ready for you July 10th to consider this uh, offer. And then the idea would be admin would stay there for? Until the building is needed for central grade school. Mm -hmm. And by then we will have enough money to abate and upgrade Sabin and that could become uh, temporary office spaces if it's determined to not be something different, which I can't envision it being anything other than office space or storage. Um, and it will need a, a bait and upgrade once we have money in the new bond, the whole entire building. Can you make sure you get a price for if we were to go from Glen Lewis to Sabin of what that would cost as well? Just the moving of it? Yep. Yeah. I, I'm going to guess it's probably pretty comparable to the moving expense from of Glen Loomis to Montessori, which was $12,000. So just to physically move everything. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit farther, though. <laughs> I don't guess. Oh, really. Okay. I'm pretty okay. close. It's, yeah, right? it's not that bad. Well, and what about the, but the, wouldn't the move from here to Glen Loomis? That's what they're cost estimating to right now. To That's what they're no, costing. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 It won't be that at all because we will actually need um, temporary partitions to create offices. So they're they're creating a cost estimate timeline to move administration offices to Glen Loomis, but not disturb permanently classrooms so that we can use it in the future. So that might mean some temporary walls, partitions, um, offices built like the one we have for benefits that is kind of a standalone office, not building walls. Or so we need to be able to to have some office spaces without ruining the structure of a classroom so that we have it available centigrade. And they're putting that cost estimate together. Now I give them a list of employees who needs a private office space versus a cubicle and what that would look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the long range plan would be at central admin would be at Glen Loomis. Glen Loomis. Correct. So you're really talking three moves. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Is there an option to keep admin at Sabin eventually? Is that something y'all have? Yeah, but I don't recommend it. Surveyed I believe, people? I or? believe we should be in town. It is yeah. my recommendation as yeah. superintendent. We I, I would think so too, that folks would just, from a- Could we do Sabin? We Walkability and you know, a central location, mm -hmm. stay downtown, but just wondered if that was something. Yeah. We, we've looked at it, debated it, talked about it. Yeah. This is my recommendation. Yeah. Okay. So I'll have that information for you. Um, the one nice thing about this particular offer is they would give us a year um, to vacate the building. So it gives us some flexibility. And so we'll have to look at that timeline and cost and see what that looks like. That's the $1 million offer we got? Yes. Okay. They would give us up to a, a year to get out. Okay. Which is some nice flexibility. We don't have a lot of information on the one. We just literally recently got that on Friday. Um, the other one, we don't have a lot of details. We just we did interviews um, starting today and tomorrow with the ones for the property out by Blair. And so I'm just literally in, in deep in that. I haven't had the chance at all to talk to this other group if the board wanted to entertain that at all, but we wanted to make sure to get it to you. Another quick question I have too is obviously with uh, Agme Township uh, yes, denying the just request. About that. Yeah. You know, it, it's. Um, I, I was looking for some feedback from this committee, and I will be exact yeah. on if that's a discussion item you guys want or not. Yeah. Well, you don't have any information no. to share other just than just what we have from we right. get the email we got yeah. from the attorney yeah. with they no. They didn't accept the counter offer. Right. Have they had a meeting since that offer? That's what I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, I. The RFP is probably still good. So. Well, but I think there's some question of, you know, Eric had talked about, is it, point, is it a point for that to hire a commercial real estate agent? You know, I, I do need some direction from the board of board to move forward with that. I have a question though, because I, I read the statement and to, to me in legalese, he meant, it meant that they didn't accept the counter offer, but I didn't hear them withdraw their original offer. They followed up in another email. So it maybe, said right on it, yeah. withdrawn. We withdraw the offer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was. So I'm not sure if you just didn't get that one, but I did yeah, ask didn't. for clarification. Yeah. Does that mean you withdraw? And they said yes. Oh. 
So. Mm -hmm. So even from their original offer, they withdrew. Yep. Because. And y'all have reached out to find see if you can get any more insights. I haven't at this point because we, but we the offer us through the lawyer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like you know I, I'm not sure like that's the board's representative to do so. So it's like, you know, I, and I kind of need some board like if the board wants me to do that, then mm -hmm. I'm willing. It's a I direction, mean, it's, you know, it's I just at the end of the day, they're not looking. One of the things they put in there, which didn't make any sense because they're not truly paying 600 up front, they're only paying 400 up front. But their comment was if we have to pay 600 up front plus do a roof at 400, that's a million we don't have. Well, it's not even really true because you're not paying 600 up front, you're only paying 400 up front. But at the end of the day, they're just not willing to take that risk if it needs a new roof. A roof wouldn't cost that much, I don't think. <laughs> at 400,000? No. Not, not at, uh, no. Not no. Yeah. Well, okay. So just curious about the, you mentioned the moving costs um, for print to, to move to Sabin. So I know you were thinking that maybe the, the sale of Bertha Boss would be the funding stream for that. So now without that sale, what are we thinking? Then uh, we have to take a look at it once we have the cost estimate. Um, we can either make a recommendation in our existing bond if we believe there's a line on that can tackle that, or we can take a look at other opportunities. Okay, so it would not be, knowing the number yeah, yet. I, yeah. I don't have a would recommendation. You, would you be able to <coughs> use the proceeds from the sale of this? Like, would you be able to front timing wise front we'd have this to, and then use the we proceeds might, to reimburse the And we can the talk to our fund? attorney about that because we did do that with um, money being held in escrow at Old Mission. We sold it, but then didn't actually give up um, possession of it for a year. So we might be able to do that. I thought the whole idea was it was not an allowable expense under the bond. So we What's had to use operating to move the print shop. Is that an allowable well, it's, expense it, or not? It's not. It, it's not a move. It's a. It's a relocation and upgrade to a facility to house them. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a bond expense. Okay. Okay. Yeah, paying a company to move them would not be it. That's not really what we're doing here. Um, we would be updating a space to be able to accept their equipment. Okay, and then the actual move would come out of operating funds. You're well. Saying. If it's or, all tied oh, together, it can be yeah. bond. Okay. If it's part of what we expect a contractor to do after they've prepared the space, it can be part of bond, which it was for Montessori. It was part of the bigger okay. project. So, right. So, roughly speaking, right now with the other things we have on the existing bond, like the STEM labs, do we think there's enough money left over, or we just don't know? We don't know yet because we're just this this close to being done with the renderings, and then going out for bid will really be the deciding factor. Until we get bid numbers back, we won't know if the full 10 million will be used or not. And then obviously we'll have a contingency and we won't know if we'll use that for a year until it's complete. Right. But we have other projects that are wrapping up that we can see if there's contingencies being put back. Transportation being one of the big ones that won't be wrapped up for a bit, but if there's ever any money coming back that's not being used for contingency can be considered for any of these projects. Very good, thank you. Um, I don't think I ans anyone answered your question. I mean, I'm, I think the goal is to sell Bertha Voss at some point. So, I mean, I think me personally, I say if, it, if a commercial real estate agent is gonna help us do that at this point, I mean, we had the, we, we, we went the RFP route and we got what we got, so. And that's what I think I need from the board <laughs> fully, I think is just, if and that's the statement, that's the statement we need. And I would maybe entertain a different option um, just knowing that we have a couple things on the table for Sabin, um, I would recommend if we don't go that route that we use it for storage. Yeah. That way we can vacate Sabin for the work we need to do there. Mm -hmm. How long would you think you would need it for? I mean, because you, you can still have it on the market. At least a year. All the stuff that's in the wing you're saying? Plus the excess storage that we wish we had right now. Yeah. It's just a dance between these all these it facilities. Is. It you're is. talking four facilities. Yeah. yeah. But if we sell Boardman first, then my recommendation, if you don't want to hire a commercial real estate agent, would be hold on to Bertha Voss. Let's make that our storage location. Do you have storage at Glen Loomis? We don't currently have storage at Glen Loomis. We have a bunch of stuff we need to find a place for, but <laughs> we don't currently have storage at Glen Loomis. But what, I mean, it's, it just got vacated, right? So I mean, yeah. would, would you? Um, not if we move administration there. No, we would not have storage at Glen Loomis. Yeah. Well, you all will figure it out. 
<laughs> and present <laughs> options to us, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I'll just, just to back up um, responding, you know, I, I'd be open to looking at a commercial real estate agent. It, um, I mean, they work on commission, so we're not talking about any right. upfront fee, um, but I, but only if it's not detrimental to your plans. Right. Yeah. It, it might be a nice tie-in. We, we already, put a timeline. We um, already have on July 10th, the boardman offer that could leave in, lead into a conversation about birth of loss. Right, that's and what I'm kind of if the board saying. wanted to make a motion, they could. For me, I mean, an RFP is one thing, like uh, having a, someone appraise it, it's it's more flexible. So yep. I, I support it, you know. It comes down to more aggressive marketing, really. It does, right? but, but and you pay for that, you know. Like you said, the nice part with this is if we could have done it, we'd have just paid our legal fees of real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to pay... Commission and... Commission. Mm -hmm. You might not end up further ahead. Yeah, yeah that's Don't know, true. but like I said, this is... Yeah. That's true. Okay. Well, you guys get to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right. Any other items on property update? If not, there's finance update. Which is yeah. So we we actually got our budget maybe 45 minutes ago, but we don't really know what it means just yet. So <laughs> it might not for a while. We did yeah, get the transportation there's a lot of, category, 450 million. There's a lot of changes in categoricals and how they operate. So we really need to dig into how that impacts us. It was a bummer to see the foundation was only the governor's proposal 458, which is what we put in our original budget. So that's a little bit of a bummer because that's our unrestricted dollars. It would have been nice if that was higher, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll take some time now over the next month and do some analysis on how each categorical may impact us. There might be some wins there, though. Like, there's a lot of details to be figured out, but there was some money for the health clinic mm -hmm. to, you know, okay. do renovation. Yes. It was a line item, yep, that did make it. Yeah, I'm curious if that's, um, like, a grant process, because I saw there's a limit. It might be, like, an MSP in two, grant. But 250000 yeah. but yeah. is it is it is it yeah. competitive? Is it, That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Lots of details that, you know, like, literally, I mean, we've got the conference report. It actually hasn't officially passed the legislature yet, but the conference report came out just, you know, literally about an hour and 20 minutes ago. And, uh, and so, like I said, but there are there's some wins, but like I said, it would have been great if the, you know, there were a lot of down, I will tell you the negative is there were a lot of Metro Detroit projects by the boatload yeah. that got funded mm. of pools and mm -hmm. roofs high school. and there's a whole you know, high school being funded. High school, I mean, there's lots that were given to Metro Detroit, nothing in Northern Michigan in that aspect, but. Mm. But how that, that categorical for transportation, that's a big deal because yeah, we're we expecting just, like a But we, we just know don't know because they're yeah. going to divide it, you know, yeah, by kids per square mile and stuff like that. Yeah. It's going to help, no doubt. Right. And it gets it established. Like I said, that'll be in the details of how Treasury, where do we fall in that dividing line, you know, where it's at still. And the problem like that is we may not know for a while. Yeah. You know, that one is they're going to figure it out and then we're just going to get a notice of what the money is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we can count on for that, but... I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, relevant for sure. Just how, you know, how relevant mm -hmm. yet to be seen. So, but it's at least finally an, an acknowledgement of transportation costs that we have. So, yeah. And it was funded for three years, 150 a year actually. Um, okay, 450 million over three years. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. It sounds like we had a little help with that somewhere. We did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. I bet you really, really pushed a lot. Good. So I made sure to send her a text right away. So. <laughs> That's all I have. All right. Any other items for the committee? If not. Do we go over, do we go over this page? If we can review it if you'd like. It's just the upcoming district projects, which this time of year tends to get pretty small. Um, most of the work that we're doing over the summer has already been uh, approved. Um, so some of the upcoming work in the future um, is pretty limited. The biggest project obviously being the STEM project and um, hopefully um, in the next week we'll have a final decision on some of the renderings with our team so we can actually uh, give the architect the go ahead to design mm -hmm. um, and then we'll know a little bit more when we can actually go out for bid. So October, November presenting to the board is that I was thinking they were going to start they were going to start in like September. That was the original goal, but yeah. it it didn't happen as it relates to some of the conversations we had to have and all the staff that we had involved in feedback. Okay. 
And are you still getting feedback from the STEM community on pretty solid that stuff? Point. Yeah, pretty solid. We've you know, and the principals have all weighed in with the, from their staffs. We're at a point today where we're awfully, awfully close Good. to the final. For West Senior High, do they pick the alternative yes, the option too? Yeah, they did. that because yeah, I went to yeah. that community input session and yeah. it was like unanimous. Everybody. It is that. nice to have that separation of like music and STEM versus athletics to have some kind of separation in the entrances and the parking. So, mm -hmm. but you know, there's little things when you see the picture of the bathrooms, you go, oh man, that just doesn't functionally work like we'd want. Yeah. You know, so you can take have them take it back and change that. And so. Mm -hmm. We went through and had our whole group together and go, okay, let's go one by one through the drawing. I mean, we spent a couple hours yeah. just, in, yeah. you know, with our high school principals and staff, just literally debating every word of this door. How each space yeah. uh, functions with the other and, yeah. How does, how, do, well, how does this doorway go into that room? Yeah. You know, and that. So. Easier and cheaper to change on paper. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Especially when you're like, oh, just change that. And the architect's like, well, code yeah. won't allow that. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a firewall. Yeah. Like we, you know, we had that a few times. Still, I mean, this last one, even mm -hmm. that's a firewall. So yeah. we've got to work through that. So, mm -hmm. but it, it'll be beautiful when we're done. All right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, it's still scheduled to be completed by this in the summer of 2024. Right. Our okay, but so open hope. for school. But fall you just can get through construction stuff. Yep. That's our goal. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. All right, excellent. We will adjourn and meet again on Wednesday, August 2nd at 4.30. Thank you.